Good evening. Tonight, I'm going to be talking about rejection in literature. So thanks for joining me. This is going to be probably a bit shorter than normal and um, it's a bit spontaneous because I was meant to be in another country and that is what prompted me to do this topic tonight because my visa was rejected. I was going to be applying to Saudi to do a book fair. Everything was all set up, it was all looking joyous, and then my visa was rejected and nothing could be done about it. Uh, so I feel highly rejected myself. And I thought that I would therefore tackle the idea of rejection in literature and how reading might help one feel less rejected. So I started thinking about all the emotions that you feel when you're rejected um, and we're going to be talking about these this evening. I think when you do have a big rejection you go through various different emotions and ways of coping with it and one of the first ones is to feel oh well maybe it's better this way. The rejection has meant that I um, can't do what I was going to do but maybe in the long run it's a better thing that I've been rejected because other opportunities will arise and I thought a good book that puts this into practice is Life After Life by Kate Atkinson which is a book in a way where when one door closes another one opens. Uh, I'm sure that lots of you know the book but if you don't it's about a girl who dies at the end of every single chapter. So this is life after life. It's actually quite a depressing book to read I have to say. I found it quite hard but then I read it um, again and liked it much more. But it's a book where you read a chapter and the heroine dies at the end of the chapter in a way that very much could happen realistically. So for instance in the first chapter she dies um, because the cord is wrapped around her neck um, when she's born and then in the next chapter I think she dies in infancy. Then in the next one she drowns age kind of four. In another one she climbs out of a, her room and falls down a roof and dies and each of these possible deaths is very believable and it's kind of like a parent's worst fears for their child but in each new chapter we then see her life as if she had survived that moment. So all in all that book which is Life After Life by Kate Atkinson is a book which is kind of all about second chances. So you might say that it's quite a good cure for rejection because in that book whenever one door closes another one opens. So in a nutshell I think that's one of the first reactions that you quite often have when you've feel rejected which is that you feel oh well maybe it's better this way one door closes another one opens so I'm going to make the most of it and a good book to make you feel like that is an option is Life After Life by Kate Atkinson and it does also have a highly satisfying ending which I will not give away for people who haven't actually read it yet. So people that are joining this evening I am who, who've only just come. My theme tonight is rejection because I personally have been rejected by an entire nation who wouldn't let me into their border. I was meant to be in Saudi this week and I'm not so I'm feeling an element of rejection and because they rejected my visa. So my theme this evening is rejection and how literature can make you feel less rejected. Um, so I've talked about that symptom that we all have when we're rejected of feeling like 
maybe it's better that I was rejected because other things can happen. Another thing that I think we quite often feel when we're rejected is a way of coping, is to think, well, things could in fact be worse. And I think that's quite a healthy way of looking at rejection is to think, well, I'm actually uh, a lucky person. I'm living in a nice house. I've got food on my table. I um, didn't get to go to Saudi this week, but I'm able to do a lovely live session with my Instagram friends. Hi, and my Facebook friends. Great to see you. So a book uh, that might help you feel like I'm a lucky person and things could be much worse is one that I'm reading at the moment and I'm loving, which is The Memory of Animals by Claire Fuller. Um, sorry, Instagram people, I haven't worked out how to flip that screen around. I'm going to keep trying, but so you're reading it backwards. So this is Claire Fuller's new book, which I think this is a advanced copy. So I'm not sure if it's actually in the shops yet, but it will be any minute now. And it's a really good book, but I've only read a third, so I can't tell you more. But we all know that Claire Fuller is amazing, a brilliant writer. She wrote her fantastic book, Unsettled Ground, which is superb and many others. Um, and this one is actually about a pandemic. And it is pretty intense. We start off with the heroine going to check herself into a hospital where she's doing a, tri a drug trial in which she's given a virus which is going around the world and killing people off. She's given the virus and then she's given an antidote and the test is to see where, essentially whether she'll survive. She's doing it for the money and when she takes the drug she thinks that this um, the virus that she's been given is not that terrible and it's not going to do her terrible harm. But she then is out for the count for seven days. She sleeps for a week and when she wakes up the world has completely gone to pot. Uh, the whole of the outside is a sea of bodies. The dogs are attacking. People are trying to get into the hospital that there's a few of them holed up in. They've only got a certain amount of food to last them. It's a classic apocalyptic story so far. But uh, one has a sense that things are going to change quite a lot. And there's a really interesting thread running through the book relating to octopuses. So the girl that was the heroine, that is the heroine of the book, is uh, an octopus expert. And she keeps telling you all about the way that octopuses work, the way, what they do when they're in captivity, how they try and escape and so on. And she is obviously in cap captivity herself. So I... I haven't got to the end of it, <clears throat> but I know it's a really good read. I completely have faith, excuse me, and trust in Claire Fuller. So I have total faith that it's going to be an excellent book all the way through. <clears throat> and I think it's a great one for reading when you are feeling rejected, because it's one that makes you feel... <coughs> things could be much worse. So that's another route to go down if you are experiencing rejection is to read those kind of books that make you realise things could be a lot worse in your life and around the world too. I then thought about another aspect of rejection is the idea that, oh well I've been rejected because it wasn't them. Sorry, it wasn't me. It was them. So if you've been rejected in love, for instance, then a good way of getting over that sense of feeling belittled and upset and hurt because you've been rejected is to think, well, the problem doesn't lie with me. It lies with them. It was their idea to reject me. There's obviously something going on from their end, which is not my problem. And they did the rejecting because they had their own issues. 
Now, a book that I think would help you in this instance is Louisa Young's My Dear, I Wanted to Tell You, which is a really great read, um, all set in the First World War. And it's about Riley Purefoy, who is the hero of the story, and his girlfriend, Nadine. And without giving too much away, the book is about how they fall in love. Um, and they do have their difficulties. He's from a lower class. She's quite aristocratic. And they get together. They have this very passionate love affair. And then he goes off to war. And when he comes back... Spoilers are coming, by the way, if anyone hasn't read this. I'm going to have to give you some spoilers in order to explain the theme of my evening, this evening, which is rejection. Um, when he comes back from the war, his face has been blasted so that he's actually missing a large amount of his face. I think he's missing essentially his chin. And it's pretty horrible. And he feels completely shattered physically and mentally. And he feels like it's utterly unfair for him to expect Nadine, his lover, to stay with him when he's completely a different person. He's, he's been ruined. He's been eternally changed. And there's no way that he can come back to being the beautiful, amazing man that he once was. But he does go into plastic surgery. And that's one of the things I love about the book is that Louisa Young talks about the pioneering plastic surgery that did happen in those days. And actually, I'll just read you a little bit from Louisa Young about why she wrote the book, which will give you an idea of all the research she did. There's an author Q&A at the back of the book. What inspired you to write, my dear, I wanted to tell you. My grandmother, Kathleen Scott, was a sculptor and during World War I, she worked briefly casting the faces of wounded men to help surgeons who were trying to rebuild their damaged faces. I wrote her biography years ago and came across photographs, drawings and diagrams of those early years of max maxillofacial surgery, which have never left me. The courage of the doctors on one side and the damaged young men on the other seemed to me quite extraordinary. And yet in wartime, in a war on that scale, it was not extraordinary. It was quite every day. So how do human beings cope with that? How do we deal with what is unbearable? Also, like most people, I'm secretly fascinated by the strange line where the miraculous and the disgusting meet. So that's Louisa Young talking about why she wrote this book. So Riley Purefoy, the hero of the book, who we're all completely in love with, by the way, as we read the book, has this terrible um, injury to his face. His face is completely shattered. And he writes a letter. This is the spoiler, everyone. Sorry about that, because it's about halfway through the book. To Nadine, his lover, saying, my dear, I wanted to tell you, um, I'm not in love with you anymore. You should go and find someone else. Which he purely does, because... He's doing it for her benefit. He wants her to go off and find someone else because he feels like he can't be her husband now that he's been destroyed by the war. It's completely tragic and incredibly moving. And I won't tell you what then happens, but that is kind of the crux of the book. And I'm talking about it this evening because my theme is rejection and how you might be able to cure feelings of being rejected and feeling rejected from reading a great book. This is a great book, which really helps because we realise that he's rejecting her for incredibly complex reasons to do with his own issues. So we realise that our own rejection might have nothing to do with us. It might well be fully to do with the issues coming from the other side. So I think this kind of book, the kind of book where it shows where the rejection is coming from the um, the other party, it's nothing to do with you being unlovable or undesirable in some way. 
it's all about the complex situation that the other person is going through. So this is a great novel to help you to feel less rejected for that very reason. Another one which uh, helps, I think, with feelings of rejection is Tess of the D'Urbervilles, a classic, which is a book that I love and talk about in many different contexts. But in this book, people that know the story will remember that Tess herself is rejected in a massive, epic way by Angel Clare for completely unjustified reasons. And this is another instance where you think, well, the rejection's all about the other person's issues, nothing to do with me. Um, just to briefly explain the story, if you don't know it, Tess, a young innocent girl, goes to go and work for a kind of distant relative cousin of hers called Alec Durberville. And he, not to um, go into too much detail with the story, rapes her. She then feels incredibly guilty and like it's all her fault. She gets pregnant. She has a baby. The baby dies. She covers herself in guilt. Then she meets a beautiful man, Angel Claire, who's very religious. They fall in love. And she decides insanely to tell him that she actually had a baby with another man which she so didn't have to spill those beans. However, she makes that fatal decision. And then, of course, being a man of his era, he thinks that it's all her fault and he completely rejects her. And things go from bad to worse. It's a really beautiful book and incredibly sad and tragic. Who has read it? I'd love to know if you have. Give me a wave if you have. Um, and... It's a really good read, which is pretty agonising, but very cathartic. So I do think this would be a good one for people who have recently experienced rejection. Then, uh, just to give you another couple of themes of how you might feel when you're rejected, there's that sense of self-doubt that you often have when you've been rejected. You feel like I've been rejected, therefore there must be things wrong with me. I must have done something wrong or I must not be good enough because let's think about rejection. It can be to do with um, relationships and lovers, but also it might just be to do with um, a job application, for instance, or um, applying for a new position somewhere or even a friendship group. So when you are rejected, you have a terrible sense of lack of self-worth. And I've got a couple of good books to help to cope with that feeling. One of which is A Gentleman in Moscow by Amor Towles. Now, I wonder if there's anyone watching who hasn't read this book yet, because it's so good. Tell me if you haven't read it. Um, you're in for a massive treat, and it has been an absolute international bestseller. So the reason that this is a great one to read if you're feeling rejected and feeling low in self-esteem is that it's about the hero of the book, who is Count Alexander Rostov, um, is put under house arrest permanently in 1922 in a hotel and it's because he is um, basically accused of being too much of an aristocrat. So he's deemed an un unrepentant aristocrat by a Bolshevik tribunal and because of that he's put into this hotel where he actually ends up living for 30 years in Moscow. And you would clearly imagine that he might feel a terrible sense of loss of self-worth and a sense of self-doubt, self-criticism, um, lack of belief in his own validity as a human being. But 
the joyous thing about this book is that the Count actually completely looks after himself, remains true to himself, has an incredibly rich inner life, manages to make friends with lots of people in the hotel where he's incarcerated, and actually has all kinds of amazing adventures within the hotel. We also go back in time into his earlier life and hear all about his escapades as a youth. And this is another one, without giving too much away, that has an excellent ending. So I do think this is a really good one for making you feel better about yourself because it makes you understand how you can go into your own inner resources even in the most difficult of times, which our count is surely in. And it also helps you realise how you can make the best of a bad situation. And he really is in a bad situation. He's been living a very exciting, adventurous, aristocratic life. And now he's actually reduced to being in a tiny room, which is only about six foot by six foot. And yet he manages to still have a pretty fabulous time. So that's a very inspiring read. Another one that I thought was great for people lacking in self-doubt and needing a bit of self-nurture is The Crimson Petal and the White by Michelle Faber, which is, by the way, don't be put off by the fact that it says now a major BBC drama. That This is quite an old copy. Um, and it was indeed when the drama was out. And it is, I think, a great TV drama, from what people say. But the book itself is far better, obviously. It's a big, fat tome. It's a great book to lose yourself in. And I would prescribe it for people when you're feeling rejected, because it's a great book to for pure escapism. It takes you to a completely different era. It's set in Victorian London. And the heroine, Sugar, is a prostitute. We meet her when she's 13, when she's just becoming a prostitute for the first time. And it's all about how she then tries to escape her fate and make herself a better life. And we slowly see her life unfold and realise how she possibly manages to do that. Um, it's a really good read. I feel it's a great one partly for making you think things could be a lot worse because she is in a pretty difficult state of being a prostitute in Victorian London. But it's also, I think, a really good one for giving your brain a great massage by taking you into a completely different world. It's incredibly vivid. When you read this book, you completely feel like you're there. So I would call reading a book like this part of your self-care routine. Um, so another thing that you might experience when you feel rejection is anger. And I'm going to read you our cure for anger from the novel Cure, an A to Z of literary remedies. And we wrote um, in this book, me and Susan Elderkin, that a cure for anger is The Old Man and the Sea by Ernest Hemingway. And I'm going to tell you why. Because even after 84 consecutive days of going out in his boat without catching a single fish, the old man is cheerful and un undefeated. And even when the other fishermen laugh at him, he is not angry. And even though he now has to fish alone, because the boy who's been with him since he was five, and whom he loves and who loves him, has been forced by his family to try his luck with another boat, he holds no grudge in his heart. And because on the 85th day he goes out again, full of hope. And even though when he does hook a big fish, the big great fish, sorry, the biggest fish that he or anyone else has ever caught, and it pulls on his line so fiercely that the skin on his hand is torn, he still lets the fish pull him further out. And though he wishes to God that the boy were with him, he's grateful that at least he has the porpoises that play and joke around his boat. And even when it's been a day and a night and another day stretches ahead and it's only him and the fish and there's no one to help, still he keeps his head. And even when he's been pushed further than he's ever been pushed in his life and he begins to feel the edge of despair, 
He talks himself round because he must think of what he has and not what he does not have, and of what he can do with what there is. And though his hand becomes so stiff, it's useless. And though he's hungry and thirsty and blinded by the sun, he still thinks of the lions he once saw on the beach in Africa, like some sort of heavenly vision, because he knows that there is nothing greater or more beautiful or more noble than this fish that tugs him ever on. And even when it is dead and the sharks come to feast, first one, then half a dozen, and the man loses his harpoon and then his knife in his attempts to fend them off. And even when he's ripped out the keel of his boat to use as a club, and even though he fails to save the flesh of the fish and the ordeal leaves him so tired and weak, he's nearly lost himself. And even though when he finally makes it to shore, all that is left of the fish is a skeleton, he accepts what has happened and is not broken or angry, but goes rather gratefully to bed. So that is The Old Man and the Sea by Ernest Hemingway. Um, and it's our cure for anger in the novel Cure. There's a few cures in this book, which Susan and I wrote as a kind of parody of the text itself, or as a kind of illustration of the way that the book is written. And that was one of them. And um, when I chose it this evening, I'd actually forgotten that it was written in the style of Ernest Hemingway, which was is rather marvellous and I remember now us writing it in that style and it actually is the way that it's written the fact that it's so hypnotic repetitive and seductive in the way it kind of pulls you in to itself like you're being pulled by a giant fish across the sea that makes you feel calm and the opposite of angry so that's why if you're feeling a sense of being rejected and you might feel angry for that reason, you should read The Old Man and the Sea by Ernest Hemingway because that is a book, funnily enough, that makes you feel calm and accepting of your fate. So... That's my ideas for books that help you to deal with rejection. Um, we've talked about My Dear I Wanted to Tell You by Louisa Young, fantastic read, which I suggested and prescribed because it's a book that makes you realise that you've been rejected not because of your own fault, but because of reasons coming from the other party. This is one that makes you feel more resilient, more able to make the most of your circumstances and to look after yourself in difficult circumstances and realise that you do have your own inner resources. Um, Tess of the D'Urbervilles is one that also helps you to realise that you've been rejected for completely um, nefarious reasons, nothing to do with your own fault. So that's quite great for making you feel better about yourself as well. And I also mentioned, oh yes, I also mentioned Kate Atkinson's book, Life After Life, which is a book that makes you feel that when one door closes, another one opens. So thanks so much for joining me tonight. I'm going to leave it there having a bit of a short one this evening because I wasn't expecting to be here. I was indeed meant to be in another country and my visa got rejected, which is why I am feeling rejected myself. Um, I was going on a work trip to Saudi and an entire country has now rejected me. So that was how I came to this theme this evening. Um, I wonder if you guys have had any rejections that you would like to share do send me a message i'd love to hear about any other um, themes that you'd like me to cover and by the way happy international women's day um today we should be celebrating strictly female authors really this evening um but i have had a couple of men too um and next wednesday i'm doing 
women's history in literature. And I'll be talking about particularly fascinating and brilliant women in history, in fiction. And that will be on the Damien Barr Literary Salon website on the um, Damien Barr's Facebook and Instagram. So do join me for that, um, which is highly topical to today as well. So that would be women's history and literature. And do keep sending me suggestions of things you'd like me to cover if you've got anything you want uh, me to talk about. And also do tell me what books you've been reading. Oh, yes, I forgot to mention at the end um, the Claire Fuller novel as well, which is also a key one um, when thinking about rejection. So The Memory of Animals by Claire Fuller, her new book, which is all about a kind of apocalyptic world. Um, it's set pretty much now, but it's about another pandemic where things get really bad. And there's a girl who's the heroine who is going through an experiment which might help to save the human race because she's trialled a vaccine for the virus. Um, but it's this is a book that makes you feel makes you feel like Things could be a lot worse, um, but it's a really good read. So thanks for joining me and I will see you all next week. Have a good evening. Good night.